Hey, thanks. Good morning. Good morning. So, thank you very much for coming. Merci beaucoup pour avoir venu ici aujourd'hui. C'est très apprécié. It's just under two weeks until Election Day on October 22nd, and I know a lot of people are already voting at advanced polling stations. We've come a long way in this campaign in just a few short months. Now, it's coming down to the crunch, and people are really making up their minds who they're voting for. And I'm going to ask voters to take a moment and reflect. There is a simple reason. Actually, you don't need this. If you are going to vote for someone because you think they are going to win, you should also be sure that they are going to do the things that you want. I'm going to ask the voters to take a look beyond the horse race of poll numbers. To take a closer look is what is actually the leading candidates are proposing. There is a public perception that Brian Bowman and Judy Washalisa Lise are at opposite ends, or at least at different sides of the political spectrum. Brian Bowman enjoys the support of the business community, and Mrs. Washalisa Lise has been endorsed by Big Labor. But if we actually look at the policies, there is surprisingly little difference between them on the issues that matter most to voters, transit, taxes, and infrastructure. On transit, Judy Washalisa Lise has promised to build the southwest leg of bus rapid transit, though she is not entirely clear how she will pay for it. Brian Bowman has promised to complete all six legs of BRT at the cost of billions of dollars and is not clear on how he will pay for it. When it comes to taxes, both are proposing tax policies that are fundamentally unfair on working and middle class families. Brian Bowman has rightly said that property taxes are regressive. They are harder on low income earners and on people that make, and less so on people who make more money. But Judy Washalisa Lise has committed to raising property taxes along with inflation and additionally with population growth at about 3.5% a year, year after year for the next four years. When you compound those increases, someone paying $2,000 in property taxes this year will be paying $295 additionally four years from now. That is an effective property tax increase of 14.75% over four years, a greater burden on homeowners while still freezing the property taxes on businesses. For his part, Brian Bowman has said he would scrap property taxes entirely and replace them with a 3 to 4% sales tax. Under a city sales tax, businesses and individuals who own the most property would get huge tax breaks while radically shifting the burden of taxes from the poor and middle class to poor and middle class families. Mr. Bowman is proposing replacing one regressive tax with one that is even worse. It would shift taxes away from people who own property, especially people who own a lot of property, to people who own no property at all. It is fundamentally unfair, and I have already released a statement explaining why. When it comes to infrastructure, Judy Washalisa Lise has promised to borrow $64 million. Brian Bowman, has said he will find an extra $10 million in efficiencies at City Hall. That is a lot of money in the couch of the mayor's office. In Edmonton, a young and dynamic mayor, Don Ivinson, made a similar promise in the last election, but he could only find two to three million dollars per year. So when you actually look at the front runner's policies, it is surprising how similar they truly are. Judy Washalisa Lise and Brian Bowman have both committed to bus rapid transit without being clear on how they are going to pay for it. They are both proposing tax policies that will make unfair, regressive taxes and will make them even worse for ordinary and middle class citizens. They both have inadequate spending commitments to the infrastructure we really need to deal with such as roads, bridges, water and sewer. On these three issues, my proposals are different. When it comes to transit, I have said I will cancel the next phase of bus rapid transit.
That is because there is a huge gap between the theory of BRT and the actual pra practice of how it is being built in our city, Winnipeg. Winnipeg's 2005 Rapid Transit Report promised over and over that if we opted for bus rapid transit instead of light rail transit, we could get a champagne system at beer prices. It's been argued that BRT is more efficient at generating development than light rail transit. But that is only true when BRT is low cost. The Southwest Transitway is anything but low cost. At $64 million a kilometer for a 7 kilometer stretch of transitway, the planned Southwest BRT is incredibly expensive. It only covers the south end of the city and only benefits a few citizens. There are people who say we have waited long enough, that we need to have built already a BRT system because it is better than nothing. And if we don't do this now, it will never ever happen. That argument in a nutshell is not only that we should make a mistake, but that we have to make that mistake as quickly as possible. If we are going to spend $450 million on rapid transit, the priority should be getting it right, not just getting it done right now. The first step in fixing transit after cancelling BRT is reorganizing Winnipeg's transit system with a metro bus system, something that will benefit all citizens across our city. It is unclamorous. It is low cost. It uses existing infrastructure, diamond lanes, synchronized lights, better planning to make sure people can get where they want when they need to buy bus. But it works, and it works in many jurisdictions around Canada and even in Asia. It gets people from place to place across our city, or it will get the people from place to place across our city. I propose a land value tax on downtown surface parking lots, and it would raise $26 million in new revenue. There have been objectives, objections raised to it, that it would take provincial approval, that it is the fact it is it mm, the fact it has been done elsewhere and it works elsewhere in other jurisdictions. If we simply expect or accept the fact that nothing is going to change and that we can't propose new ideas, then that is a recipe for stagnation. We have to keep pushing for change in order to see something different, something more beneficial for all Winnipeggers. I have further proposed creating a $250 million fund, fully financed by $12 million from the land value tax, that would be directed to core infrastructure such as roads, bridges, water and waste. I focused on fair taxation, creating a better transit for the whole city and infrastructure funding that can have a real long-term impact on the economic output and productivity in our city. The time is now to make basic infrastructure a priority. Now I've also said that I want to move towards with rail relocation. So let me just set out some timelines about this. The Social Planning Council of Winnipeg had an initial report which estimated the timeline for rail relocation at five years from the start of planning. Two years of planning from 2014 to 2016. A year of negotiations with the rail companies in 2017. Relocation starting in 2018 to 2019. In areas where rail yards are being decommissioned, environmental remediation could take place in 2020 to 2021. With BRT cancelled, the city can focus on core infrastructure repairs to roads and water treatment plants for two years while the planning and costing the rail relocation process takes place. We can start moving on this now, but not if we build BRT first. I want to address the criticisms directed about the potential costs of rail relocation. First, as I mentioned yesterday, the train derailment in Saskatchewan at Wadena is a demonstration of how the nature of rail cargo has changed in our country. We are shipping more oil by rail than ever before. I cannot say for certain what rail relocation will cost. That is the whole point of having a proper study and doing the proper research. But I think there is a good reason to think that it could cost less than we think. We know for certain that if we relocate rail, we can avoid spending money on infrastructure to work around it.
When it comes to the city's infrastructure deficit, we can scratch off the $100 million for the Arlington Bridge. We can scratch off $50 million for the underpass at Waverly and Taylor. People have tossed around numbers about cost without really considering what we are proposing and how it is different than what has been proposed in the past. I will make some critical distinctions. Transportation infrastructure costs more when it is new than when it is in a developed urban environment. New BRT and new light rail transit costs a lot to develop in the middle of a city. But new rail in undeveloped rural areas laying track across a farmer's field and repurposing existing rail lines and infrastructure are two of the lowest costs and kinds of rail infrastructure we can have. Winnipeg's Rapid Transit Report of 2005 actually explored the use of rail lines next to Pembina for a diesel passenger train. The project was project projected to cost slightly more than BRT, but much, much less than light rail transit. It was rejected not because of cost, but because the rail line was still going to be in use. Not only does the Southwest BRT line involve moving a part of the rail line 18 meters over, but every single planned extension of BRT is supposed to run next to existing rail lines in the city. And just as important, if new rail is built outside of the city, the cost of bridges, underpasses and overpasses are no longer borne or no longer a cost to the city of Winnipeg. It is now a provincial responsibility. Would it require agreement from the federal and provincial governments and rail companies? Yes, but that is no reason not to proceed. I think I've made it very clear that my policies are very different from Brian Bowman's and Judy Washalichalichis. Politicians and their campaigns spend a lot of time trying to come up with policies, making promises and announcements. And we should take them seriously at what they do and when they do it. I hope our citizens, all citizens in the city of Winnipeg, will take a close look at the front runners and take a look at what I am actually offering and make their cho choice based on a long-term vision for our city and what they want their mayor to actually do. Not to settle because they believe they need to settle for that choice, but to truly make a choice for the long-term future of our city. To make a choice for the type of city that we wish to live in in 20, 30, 50, 100 years. So, merci beaucoup. Thank you very much. Salamat. Et tapwekitwam. Bravo. I'll take any questions. <laughs>